start with one of the challenging cases which uh, I came across and uh, starting with a brief clinical history, she is a 79 year old lady. She had a low, a low demand lifestyle, she had a domestic fall, she sustained a distal femur fracture. Uh, she had both knee pains before the fall, before she sustained the fracture. She was operated elsewhere and she presented to me eight months later. And during this eight months she was completely non-ambulant. And uh, the, the reason they seek uh, my consulting was uh, she was having pain on turning in bed and it needed some painkillers. Uh, needless to say she was unable to bear any weight. and. When I did their x-rays, this was what I found. Okay, so hold on. So, uh, Suri, what do you see, what do you think? This is a non-union of the fixation. The implants, though they are holding, there's a still a lot of a gap. I'm certain there should be some mobility. But overall alignment is good. But taking into consideration three points which you mentioned uh, in your history, a non-ambulant patient who is bedridden, very low demand. My threshold in this case would be for a distal femur fixation. Okay, does anybody After on the panel? ruling out infection. All right, ruling out infection. Does anyone on the panel have a different opinion? Distal femur replacement, is that what yes. you meant? Yes. Yeah, yeah. same. <clears throat> One of the panel agrees? No? Yeah, no, I think I agree. But what I would say is if this patient were younger, I would try not to throw out that femur. Uh, I would yeah. try to shish kebab it and graft it and get it to heal with a more conventional knee replacement. But it, with an old, old patient, I, I grant you, that's what I would do too. Okay, uh, but who's, uh, Dr. Rajgopal, what do you think? I'd agree with that. I mean, low demand, uh, almost bedridden, that's a quick fix, easy way to get out of the situation. And Dr. Tapasvi? So uh, she's got pain, right? We, I think uh, you know, we need to also understand where, a pain, where her pain is coming from. 99 out of 100 times, it is going to be coming from her arthritic knee. But I think we need to rule out infection as a cause of pain. And maybe that non-union also as a cause of pain, we need more orthogonal views. A certain what her, sorry? OK, infection is ruled out. So I think we also need to look at what is the uh, cause of her pain and try and treat that. Excuse me, sir. Uh, I, we, uh, I evaluated the same, and on the next slide, we will know the reason for pain. Because something's funny with her patella there. I can't see it too well. All right, so let's keep going. Let's, right. let's see what you got. Right, so the reason, was, reason of pain was the implant failure. And uh, that's why she had pain on turning in bed. And there was a broken screws distally. That was about so. so how you how you rule that infection? Uh, we did, I did a, a complete uh, blood workup. Uh, ES, ESR, CRP were normal. Her blood workup was normal, uh, and then so that was. Did you uh, aspirate the joint? No, I did not aspirate. There was no local rise of temperature. There was no swelling. The knee was quite, uh, and then absolutely there was no infection whatsoever. So the skin was quite good. Who's aspirating the joint? All right, almost everyone's going to aspirate the joint. So. In a knee, especially where it's easy to aspirate, and you know you have a, a non-union here, I, th I think it's pretty reasonable. Did you do any other imaging, a CT scan, MRI? No, no. Okay, keep going. MR, if I could just say one thing, just it's a, it should be important for the audience. I guess it's obvious, but if this patient didn't have arthritis, then this would be a refixation of the non-union, right? Not just throw the femur away, because this is a pretty big chunk of femur. Yeah. With the arthritis, it makes it easy, but. It's arthritis and it's 79. That, that, that's what but, we're... But if it was 79 with a normal joint, I don't think we'd be throwing away the femur, right? Yeah. With, with a piece of bone this big? I don't think so. Because, I mean, distal femur replacement is an expeditious operation, but the complication rate is 25%. So that's what it is. Yeah. No, I, 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 I buy that. Okay. Um, so what, what, what's going on? So I explored the joint, I uh, uh, did an implant removal, I resected the distal femur and used a tumor prosthesis implant. Uh, these were the intraoperative photos and uh, that's the post-operative x-rays. So you put beads in? Uh, yeah, stimulant beads, yeah. 
So why did you do that? Uh, as a precaution, just as a preventive. Because every revision or every second surgery, I, I, as a rule, I, I put in stimulant beads. So you didn't aspirate the knee because your suspicion no. wasn't high then, but you're... Yes, yes. To, I mean, whatever, uh, to reduce the risk of infection post -op, uh, post -op, after my surgery. So I think. What do you think about the concern that some people have had with stimulant beads and uh, drainage and seromas? Are you worried about that or not really? Uh, no, really, sir. I have not faced much issues because, uh, uh, mainly because of a watertight closure. So, uh, I, and I definitely delay my suture, my wound uh, suture removal. So, and then regularly check. I have never faced uh, wound issues, though I have heard from a uh, couple of my colleagues that stimulant does, is known to give uh, uh, drain, uh, wound drainage problems. So, Mar, uh, just a quick question. Subvastus uh, for a distal femoral replacement, is that your, go your standard subvastus yes. you go for everything? Or? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am trained uh, by Dr. Nilin Shah, so... Uh, ah, so <laughs> that explains it. Right. <laughs> but I think when you are doing a subvastus, Dr. Raj Gopal, when you're doing a subvastus and you have to go that high, you risk injury to your superior, uh, supreme genicular artery, isn't it? I mean, and you can just have that whole VMO just go completely necrotic afterwards. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. Just because you were trained to do something one way, right? We've, we all have learned new techniques and new uh, ways of doing things. So uh, yeah, I think you made a, an, uh, you, you did fine. It looks fine. The exposure looks good. You have a wide exposure. Um, but medial parapetellar works fine. And I think I, what you heard today was everyone is going back to the basics, right? Right. Nothing fancy is needed. So uh, the approach that one is comfortable, it should be followed. Uh, I'm more comfortable with subvestus. I I'm actually I panic when I do par parapetellar. So <laughs> okay. fair enough. Okay, keep going. Is there anything else? Yes. Uh, this is uh, after one year of surgery when she came to me for the other knee. Uh, this was her uh, recovery. So. Very good.